you can't spend enough time casting. And while you're casting, it's a good idea to give uh, uh, the actors a lot of latitude, a lot of room to improvise and say, listen, you know basically what the scene is about now. Um, put it in your own words. How, how, would it, uh, how would you say this? And um, you'd be surprised how you get some good lines. Uh, a, a classic example of that is with uh, Burgess Meredith when we were uh, uh, casting for the part of Mickey, the guy who, who trains uh, uh, Rocky, who becomes his manager. And um, the scene we used to, uh, to uh, audition was when Rocky comes up to uh, Mickey in the beginning of the picture and complains about his, uh, his uh, locker being uh, gone. And, um, and uh, Mickey says, you're just a tomato, take a hike. And, uh, and I had said to um, uh, Burgess, you know, if you want to... So as Sylvester turned to walk away, uh, Burgess said, hey, Rock, you ever think about retiring? Now, yeah. Sylvester hadn't written this line, but he's an actor, and a good one, and he was in the scene, so he said, no. And Burgess says, well, start thinking about it. And I thought, oh, yeah, this is perfect. That's exactly what this, uh, this guy uh, would say. If you can get two or three actors at the same time, or certainly after you've uh, uh, weeded, weeded some out, so you're down to your favorites, right? Put them all together, switch them around, see how they uh, interact. Because if they get the part, that's who you're going to be stuck with. So try to get as much of a free taste first as you can. The whole time is very important, from casting the actors to casting the, the crew to finding the locations, uh, to going to the locations beforehand to rehearse with your cast and to video that just the way you figure you're going to shoot it and put it together, edit it, and look at it before you go into, and do it for real. That way, you, you look and you say, you know, I don't like that so much. I think we ought to do it. And why doesn't he look out the window on that line? Rather than waiting till the circus is there and now it's done and now you're sitting there looking at it and saying, oh, God, now what do I do? Well, you do it beforehand. Take advantage uh, of that. So by the time you come to shoot, you've worked it all out. You've worked out the mechanics. That doesn't mean that, God forbid, while you're doing it, you should get an idea. Terrific. But at least nobody's going to be saying to you, where do we put the camera? Right? That's not a secret. You want everybody to know. You want them to have storyboards. You would say, these are the eight shots we get before lunch, and then we're breaking at lunch at 2 o'clock, and blah, blah, blah. So that the time that you have to shoot is used as, as efficiently as you can, because that's the precious time. That's the expensive time. So you don't want to be figuring things out on that time. Encourage suggestions. Say now, get everybody together and say now, anytime anybody has idea, an idea, I don't want you to whisper, to them, gee, why the, why are you have them looking out the window, for Christ's sakes? Tell me. I may not take the idea, and that doesn't mean you shouldn't give me the next one. Because if I like it, it's going to make it better, and I'll get credit for it anyway. <laughs> so encourage people to contribute uh, their ideas. And if you've done a good job in selecting the right people, you'll get some good ideas. Um, sometimes there are conflicts between directors and, and DPs, directors of uh, photography. Um, and if you're going to want to look through the camera, or make a shot, or whatever it is, you've got to have that, uh, uh, that latitude to do that. Now, you also want to listen to your cameraman. Because they may have a terrific idea. Or they'll say, you know, we're not going to see it because there'll be a silhouette because the guy's against the window. Um, and you want to make sure that your, your actors listen to the cameraman. It's important to, uh, to shoot as much as you can, and if you don't know how you're going to use it and you can shoot it, shoot it, and something will uh, come up. And when you start the editing process, You, you look at this stuff and, and, and you say, who shot this stuff? This stuff is terrible. How am I going to save this poor guy's ass by cutting this stuff so it doesn't look so bad? And that's why you ought to be an editor, too.
So while we were in Africa, we went to some terrific waterfalls, Angel Falls. When you're at a place like that, get a lot of footage of it, because you don't know how the hell you're going to use it. But because we had all that footage, when it came time to, uh, to cut it, uh, I, I was uh, prompted to, um, to make a little uh, montage of all the, uh, the water and so forth. Whereas if I didn't have the footage, then I couldn't, uh, I couldn't have done that. When I got the job and uh, knew there was going to be a lot of uh, boxing, and I'm not a particularly uh, fan of boxing, uh, I started looking at a lot of uh, movies that had boxing in it. And most of them looked pretty phony baloney. So I figured um, it was going to take a lot of time to get the boxing to look real. We scheduled the boxing stuff to come at the end of the movie, so it would give the actors that much more time to uh, learn their stuff. And um, we started a couple of weeks before the movie began. So the first day, uh, we had, it's Jim in Santa Monica and um, uh, Sylvester and uh, Carl Weathers are there, and they get in the ring, and one says, oh, I think I'm going to do this. And the other guy says, no, no, I'm going to do it. And I said, we're going to be here all day. Uh, Sylvester, why don't you go home and write this thing out? Lefts, rights, this guy gets knocked down, this guy gets up. Whatever you want, write it out. And then we'll learn that like a ballet. He liked the idea. He went away, came back next day, 32 pages, I think it was, of lefts and rights. And that's what we began to learn. And I shot uh, eight millimeter uh, of, uh, of the rehearsals. And, um, and I'd show it to the actors to show them how terrible they looked so that they would be motivated to, uh, uh, and also showed them the kind of angles that I was going to be uh, getting so they could see how important it was to take a punch. You have to throw the punch, but then you've got to know uh, how to take it and when to snap your uh, head back vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, the punch that's uh, coming at you. So they really did their homework, and they worked on it really well. Nobody got hurt, nobody got touched, and the thing ended up looking terrific. I remember when I was cutting, uh, when I was cutting the, um, the boxing, uh, sequence in uh, in Rocky on a, on a camp and I started putting in uh, the sound effects of of the punches right um, so I had a, a whole roll of, uh, of punches and I started building that uh, that effects track with the punches and it took me about an hour or two and cutting and pasting and putting them all in and now I rewound it and now I played it for myself for the first time. Oh, it was great to suddenly hear the punches now when you never heard anything because there weren't any punches. And that, I'll never forget the thrill of that. Uh, I got uh, fired too many times. I got, I turned down uh, uh, scripts that I wish I hadn't. Uh, folks who say, oh, I have no regrets. I don't know, they're from another planet. Uh, I have a lot of them. Um, so my, my advice uh, to the uh, perspiring director is to, um, uh, to listen, uh, stick by your guns, but be diplomatic. And prepare like the Boy Scouts. Be prepared. When you're standing in the back of the theater and the audience is responding as you hoped that they would, it feels great. John. Oh, yes. My God. Lloyd Kaufman. You know how long it's been? Well, it's been about, uh, oops, we finished Cry Uncle. When did we finish it, John? Well, what time is it now? Uh, it seems like only yesterday. But it couldn't have been yesterday because I was in the valley yesterday. So it must have been uh, almost 30 years ago. Well, what did you take from it in terms of the state of A rash. And I just, uh, Recently got rid of it, though. How about uh, when you were doing uh, Rocky? And I'd say, oh boy, I wish I were back doing Cry Uncle. Well, it was, um, you know, the last sort of really low budget thing that I did, you know, um, where I shot the thing myself. It was the, the end of an era. It was a very short era. It's sort of an era corn, actually. Uh, well, how about the practical? Lessons. It seems to me that you applied, when I worked for you on Rocky, and when I observed you on the fifth Rocky, and on other movies, 
it seems to me that you are very much location oriented. That you sure, if you shoot on location, that's one less thing that you don't uh, have to worry about. About a set looking like something that already exists. So it's always uh, it's always better, I think, to uh, to work on on location where wherever it might be. It makes you think harder, and it's going to look better and. It's going to be lit more real because you don't uh, have the, the catwalks over your head where you can put more lights. Things are usually overlit um, or overlighted or overlitted. And um, so I'm always a, uh, a, a location fan. Was when you rehearse today? Do you rehearse? It? My recollection was on Cry Uncle. Yeah, we rehearsed on location. It makes a lot of sense because, and especially with this little uh, camera that you have in your hand now, because, uh, and even in the old days, I would shoot uh, the rehearsals with the, uh, the, the eight millimeter uh, uh, film, and um, and then you can cut this stuff together, which is very easy to do now on uh, on video, and um, you cut it together, and uh, you have a, an idea of what the movie's going to be before you uh, go and shoot it. Now, when we did Cry Uncle or Joe or these <coughs> movies that we do, we have uh, pretty much unlimited rehearsals. The actors are all willing to do it. Mm -hmm. Can do you video it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <coughs> we, we, go, we do it in the rehearsal room, then we go to location, then we mm -hmm. go again. Do you cut the, uh, the tapes? We, ha we, did, we did in the location, yes, mm -hmm. so I could pick angles. Mm -hmm. This was the first film we ever did that. Yeah, Before well, if you actually cut it, then you see the movie and yeah. say, you know, this works or this doesn't work or whatever. You get a... Uh, you got a free shot, so you don't have to say, "Who?" Oh, ah, look at this. Question to you: Now that you do these big movies with big, big-time stars, can you get rehearsal with them? Well, it, if you pay for it, yeah, and do, you know, do do the budgets. Well, you know, uh, this thing that I just uh, finished, we just had a week of rehearsal, so uh, it's um, it's unfortunately uh, costly, but it's a great savings because when it comes time to shoot, it goes much quicker. And it's much better. The product that you end up with is, is much better, I think. Yeah. Cry Uncle, after Cry Uncle is finished, Joe becomes a huge hit. Did your phone start ringing? And, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Jack Lemon called me. Uh, he saw it, and that's what got me uh, Save the Tiger. But meanwhile, um, uh, we're making uh, the Jackie Mason uh, movie down in Florida, uh, The Stoolie. And then a couple of days before we're finished with this uh, uh, Jackie Mason uh, movie, I get fired. Was that the first job you ever got fired? I mean, you don't have to answer. Uh, yeah, I think so. And why did he get rid of you? Well, because um, uh, the night before, uh, I went uh, a little late. Entirely my uh, fault, and I could have done it in a much more uh, economical way, but I got seduced by a sunset. And, shot the sunset rather than the big production number first and um, and I was um, I had some uh, uh, good backstabbers uh, on the uh, on the staff and um, uh, Jackie uh, was uh, swayed and uh, and I got uh, canned but then um, that um, uh, led into uh, uh, save the tiger and that was a great experience um, Jack Lemon was, uh, I always say that Lemon was a peach. And you can uh, see Jack Lemon right over there. And right up on, on top is uh, Frank Capra. And that's Marlon Brando uh, with the slate right in front of him. Kevin Costner? Not likely. <laughs> no, that's Luke Perrot. Oh, okay. How would you have handled Serpico? Oh, I, and instead of. I would have said, well, gee, let me think about that. Or, yeah, we could. What happened? Oh, I think um, uh, I was very enthusiastic. I visited uh, Frank in uh, Switzerland with Norman Wexler, um, who I uh, got to uh, rewrite the script, and um, everything was going great. Came back, met with uh, uh, De Laurentiis. I think the producer at that point realized I didn't want to hire his girlfriend as uh, one of the actresses. And I'd also visited uh, uh, Serpico's uh, uh, childhood home where his parents still lived and thought that would be the place to shoot it. Now, it was a very small uh, apartment, but, you know, we've shot in a lot of small apartments, and I had no fear of, uh, of, of doing that, but 
uh, the producers started saying, oh, that we have to shoot that in the studio. And I said, you don't have to shoot that. Why spend all that money building this place when it already uh, exists? And I got uh, hot under the collar, as I did in those days. That's when I used to button my collar. I leave it open now. And um, Dino said, uh, there's the door. And like a schmuck, I left. So that's a big regret that I didn't, uh, I didn't uh, play uh, more diplomatically and uh, end up uh, making that movie. Because I, uh, I regret not making it. Don't uh, give the studio a lot of lift. Take a deep breath. I asked Frank Capra once, I said, how did you make all those movies and you, and you seem to get along with the, uh, with the front office and you, and you got your way, how, how did you do that? He said, very easy. Let them think they're involved. Now, you think I would have listened to that, right? Well, maybe you, you young, uh, perspiring film student, maybe you'll listen. That's the, uh, that's good advice. Uh, what what film do you like the best? Or what was the best experience? You no, know, they're all my children. Yeah. Uh, gee, I don't know. Maybe uh, uh, Power of One. Maybe Lean on Me. Um, Rocky certainly turned out just the way I wanted it to. Have all your films pretty much turned out? Uh, Ooh, the majority, fun? sure. Uh, uh, the first uh, two uh, Karate Kids uh, I was very pleased with. You know, but things like uh, ladies, what was it called? Night in Heaven, oi. You know, or the formula. There are uh, uh, turkeys in my closet. And what, what happened, say, with uh, the formula? Well, I never thought it would, uh, I never thought it was going to get made into a movie. And I figured I'd uh, pick up some uh, change and not have to uh, make the movie. Imagine my surprise and disappointment when they said, of course we'll make this movie. You will? You're not going to do it now? Oh, and then I made a great uh, a judgment call in going with uh, George Scott instead of Gene Hackman. Oh, brilliant move. Oh, God. Mm. He, he, uh, that was his uh, difficult period, I guess. It was his very difficult period. <laughs> no, I'm sure that he's uh, cleaned up his act and he's a, he's a terrific actor, but in those days, ugh. He didn't want to be directed? He, he didn't want to be interrupted. Uh -oh. <laughs> he was busy uh, doing other things. So there are those uh, uh, those turkeys that, um, but you learn from them. One hopes. Certainly, Cry Uncle is a, a bright a bright spot on my um, filmography chart. Do you feel that you go for the underdog and the uh, outsider and? Mm, yeah, but that's not a new idea. I mean, but is that something that you? I don't go out of or my or way, you know. And then you also get pigeonholed, you know. Now I get all these sports dramas and stuff. I have no interest in sports. I have no interest in boxing. Um, if I had done Serpico, I would have gotten all the movie, all the um, the cop stories. I'd never done a boxing movie before Rocky. You know, so. Um, why, why do I keep getting them after Rocky? But I guess if you're the head of the studio and say, okay, now, who knows how to do uh, boxing movies? Oh, Appleson. Oh, yeah. What's even worse than that is um, um, if they say, well, who can do a boxing movie? And they say, Appleson says, is he still alive? <laughs> <laughs> what is the name of the new film? With well, it may be called Coyote Moon. It's in a uh, transition period right now. Uh, it's not clear as to whose version of the film will uh, prevail. What's happening in other words? Uh, do you Anguish and stress. But, well, in other words, in the past, could people have taken the film and recut it on you like that? Oh, yeah. Well, you know, unless you pay for it yourself, it's not yours. I've never had Final Cut. I had, um, on, uh, on eight seconds, I had a variation of that because I, I had a test score that was uh, such that that assured my, uh, my cut. Oh, so that was a contractual. If you get a certain yeah. test score, you know. Right. Wow. And and uh, but you for the most part you've gotten what you want. Yeah. Most of the cuts have been. Uh, you know everybody's seen the the wisdom of it. So this time. Uh, I guess the only one that I haven't had that I can remember was Rocky Five. I think some of uh, uh, Sylvester's uh, best scenes were cut out of it. Yeah. You know. Yes. Yeah. But what do I know? Getting back to the new film, you did an edit and then. Yes. 
and uh, and uh, Jean Claude said, "Oh no, we can make this uh, we can make this much better." So uh, he, he, Jean Claude Van Damme will edit the film. Has. Oh, he has it. Right. So he is an editor. He's one of his many uh, one of his many uh, uh, traits and uh, and crafts and um, and I've uh, had a look at it, which I was very disappointed. So I hope to uh, prevail and uh, let them uh, uh, in on why I think it's um, better the other way, and they will um, they will uh, do what they will do. They could have two different uh, crowds and show both two different versions. Well, that's um, that's what I would uh, that's, that's what I may do with John Claude to challenge him as like a sporting event. You know, let's um, let's leave it up to the people. I had a couple of screenings. I got uh, my test scores. Let's see how your uh, test scores are, you know, and uh, the loser pays. So we'll see if he uh, wants to step up to that. I, I doubt if he will. Perfectly fair and perfectly logical. Yeah, perfectly not likely. <laughs> John is in the background on the phone. He's talking to somebody about the exact uh, Van Damme situation. He's literally saying he wants to challenge Van Damme. He wants to, John wants to show his version of the movie against uh, Van Damme's version of the movie. If John gets a higher mark with a test audience than Van Damme's, great. And if Van Damme's version gets a better mark than John's, then so be it. And John is literally on the phone right now with someone who I assume is uh, related to the movie. What are you uh, working on now? Uh, after this thing is over, I have um, just more uh, home movies of uh, Bridget. Let me show you something. Uh -huh. Maybe we could get uh, Gus Van Zandt to do uh, that's it, that's uh, it. another <laughs> cry uncle. That's it. That's it. <laughs> shot for shot. Yeah. Now, when I was coming along, I came to a crossroads. Film school or no film school? Luckily, no film school would have me. So I decided to attach myself to what I perceived to be talented independent directors who were coming along, and I would use their movies as film school. And I would work for free for some of them. For example, John Avelson, before he did Cry Uncle, I was his assistant. I did Xeroxing. I, I think I babysitted for his kids. And um, they were cute, too. And uh, I went to uh, laundry. After I worked on Cry Uncle and Joe as basic uh, toilet cleaners or shit boys or whatever I did, I got to work on Rocky. And the reason is that John Avelson and Sylvester Stallone wanted to film the scenes in Philadelphia on real locations. And the rest of the movie was filmed out in Los Angeles. There was not enough money in the budget to come to Philadelphia and use a normal union crew to film the location work in Philadelphia. So what happened? Avelson and Stallone hired the trauma team with me as, as a production supervisor. It wasn't really the trauma team. It was the crew from Cry Uncle, non-union, who, uh, under my uh, organization, uh, filmed all that stuff with Stallone going up the steps in the museum and uh, the fruit market and the pet store. Imagine Rocky without those locations. Anyway, we filmed all that under the radar of the unions, and the strategy was that we'd keep filming until the Teamsters discovered us. Well, about the eighth day, the Teamsters did discover us, and I got my legs broken. <laughs>